Good afternoon and uh, welcome to Grand Rounds. A uh, couple announcements. The first is that uh, we will not be uh, presenting Grand Rounds uh, next week or the week after. Uh, the other uh, uh, announcement is that, uh, we're going to be doing our program evaluation uh, after the program with the audience response system that you picked up on the way in. And so if you could stay around for a couple minutes after the uh, presentation uh, the, to uh, respond to a couple questions and uh, it gives us some idea as to uh, the effectiveness of the, the Grand Rounds presentation. Uh, also please remember to sign the attendance record and uh, also please remember to fill out, the, well, we'll be using the, the program evaluation of the audience response uh, system. Uh, today uh, it's my pleasure to reintroduce Dr. Selden Spencer. Dr. Spencer is a member of the Department of Neurology at McFarland and uh, MGMC. Uh, he is a, f a frequent, generous, and excellent contributor at uh, Grand Rounds, and he's here today to update us on cranial nerve disorders, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Spencer. Great, thank you. Well, I hope uh, you haven't made a wrong term and you're looking for the Christmas Bazaar. That's actually in the next room over. If not, it's good that you're here, and I thank you for the opportunity. Um, let me explain that initially this was designed to be all the cranial nerves in one talk and it got out of control so this is the front six cranial nerves and the more I thought about it it's really kind of uh, neuro ophthalmology for dummies uh, it's not uh, real sophisticated about it I'm very happy to present it because it's a practical approach to these cranial nerves, and I think uh, all of us encounter these problems, and so I hope this will be useful to you. So, let's see here. Uh, I go ahead and drive it this way, Tim, or this way? How about that? Well, I'm welcome open to uh, suggestions here. <laughs> you have to retool it or something like that? It doesn't have that wonderful background we had no. designed either. I don't know what the, that kind of went the way, did it? Yep. Yeah, the original background was gray with uh, pink letters. I <laughs> thought that was pretty. Special. <clears throat> All right. There we go. All right. So yeah, this is not very, uh, very uh, pretty kind of boring. Um, now, Tim, I still need to get something to go uh, so I can point at things. Maybe this will point. This doesn't do anything either. Okay, well, anyway, this is the... I really do need to get some kind of pointer on this thing eventually. But um, the outline of the t talk was as shown in the previous slide, which is we're going to talk about anatomy, and then we're going to talk about specific nerve disorders, and uh, the natural thing is how common are they, uh, what are the causes, and what can you do about them, all right? All very practical kind of things. That's the one. Yep. Bottom button. Bottom. Okay. And so here we're down and dirty, and what we're going to talk about is the uh, olfactory and we're going to talk about the optic nerve. We're going to talk about the peculiar little oculomotor nerve, which is the uh, sixth and the uh, third and the fourth, which is in there somewhere. But anyway, the point of it was I wanted to make sure you understood. We're looking at the base of the brain and all these things sticking off the base of the brain. And then they do have very specific uh, bony anatomy that goes with them. For instance, the opt optic foramen and the superior orbital fissure, which bear on the health of these different nerves. Um, so, all right. And this is, of course, what you really came to see. Um, we're not going to punish you with this because we're going to kind of focus just on these top 
ones right here. We're not going to talk about sensation of face or muscle face or tongue or ears or vastric viscera or neck muscles. That'll be a later date, but just the anterior part. And so we'll jump in and talk about olfaction. <coughs> um, used to be in the old days, this was a big deal. When I was in training, you know, you would test for uh, olfaction because that was only one way you could get at the anterior part of the brain. Uh, the CT scan uh, and all the other advents of imaging have made this pretty uninteresting anymore, but there's always a lot of complaints that you're going to hear from patients about smell, loss of smell, loss of taste. And I want to emphasize a couple of things about smell. One is it's very close to this cribriform plate, which is very friable and breaks very easy. A good punch to the nose can do it. And lo and behold, these nerves are very friable and they go away. And when they go away, their relationship intimately with your anger centers, whether it be amyloid or I mean amygdala or the memory centers, also goes away. And then the very intimate relationship, uh, similar pattern coming from the taste. Now, why you lose smell and you lose taste is a very interesting question, and I still I think it's pretty well unresolved. I couldn't find anything that made a whole lot of sense about that, but. That is a very common phenomenon. Um, I do want to kind of talk about uh, a couple of oddities. You know, back in the day, we used to test with cinnamon. I mentioned that already. But it's still relevant as you come in and if you see a patient that talks about rear, weird, positive smells of one sort or another, you do have to worry about problems with the temporal lobe with the epilepsy. And uh, that's a very good red flag to pay attention to, not to blow off. It is very popular, and every time you go to the national meetings, they talk about these uh, different um, smell tests that you can take to your office. And detecting smell or deterioration of smell is a harbinger of neurodegenerative disease, whether we're talking about Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease. Very peculiar. I'm not quite sure, but again, it gets, speaks to the very sensitivity of that class of neurons. Um, loss of taste in a relationship, I mentioned that, and again, the most common cause is uh, trauma. Now, there are a couple of curiosities here. People with meningitis or Lyme's disease will quite often have hyperosmia, where they're just very, very sensitive, and of course, uh, any of you have talked to migraineurs, the unique nature of certain smells precipitating their episodes is quite common. Um, so I mentioned also about the relationship there. And it's still popular and still out there that we may see the use of the nose and the uh, olfactory neurons as a mechanism for administering drugs. There was a very popular study a couple years ago using insulin for improving cognitive function uh, through intranasal administration. And um, that hasn't quite died, but it may well go away. Last thing I want to say, and which is very popular, we talk an awful lot about stem cells and using pluripotent stem cells to uh, administer to the caudic nucleus to replace uh, things with Parkinson's disease. The, uh, and you're taught in elementary school that, gee, you're set with a certain number of neurons, those neurons go away, you're gone. That's not true. The olfactory neurons are one location where you get new neurons all the time. Now they don't hook up all the time, but um, that's an interesting area that may yield some interventions along the way. Okay, so now on to the more troublesome one that we still deal with an awful lot is the optic nerve. And uh, what I want to kind of, I wonder if this will show very, yeah, this shows pretty good. Okay, this will work better. So anyway, here's the big yellow optic nerve sticking into the back of the eyeball. And this uh, picture is primarily to emphasize the very rich vascular arrangement. And uh, this one below is to emphasize the very complicated other nerve influences which are going to the eye, namely with the uh, tridemonal system and some of the sympathetic innervation with the oculomotor system and some of the parasympathetic influences. So it's a big mess. Uh, it's very complicated, but it has a very unique little slot in the bone that we can pay attention to. 
when we're doing our imaging. So I don't know quite why I put this one on, but anyway, just to emphasize nerve fibers. And I apologize, but I think in the problems of getting this all set up, I skipped over a slide early on, which just talked about what the nerve looks like. It's a pipe. I really think, ah, uh, no, I'm not going to go back. But, uh, you know, again, whether we're talking about the hypoglossal nerve or we're talking about the optic nerve, you're talking about a pipe that has a fibrous outside that is very vascular and uh, hence prone to stroke and injury that way. And then very tight little uh, packaging of axons covered with myelin. And the other part of that is that the myelin is different than the myelin inside the brain. And that's where you hear the word Schwann cells, Schwannomas. Those cells are unique and the source of lots of uh, books, but uh, there's nothing that's really terribly relevant clinically uh, from all of that. So when we're looking at the optic nerve, there are four portions. We're going to look at the part that's part of the eye, then the part that's behind the eye in what's called the orbit, and then the part that goes through the foramen, and then getting into the chiasm. Now, um, this is probably not what you really, really want to see, but again, we're looking at the optic nerve here in these different portions, and what we're going to talk about in a moment is you really want to have this type of visual field. If you read uh, articles about optic neuropathy, they say don't rely on the field, but I will tell you as a first pass, if the person comes in and says, I can't see, and you're trying to figure out whether it's an optic nerve problem, they got to lose vision in that whole eye. It can't be split. It can't be horizontal. It can't be vertical. They've lost vision in one eye, or it's very dulled out. Now, if they are very cooperative, and you can see all these other kind of arrangements where they have a bitemporal hemianopsia or a homonymous hemianopsia of one sort or another, then you're home free because it doesn't have anything to do with the optic nerve. Um, so this is then the uh, intraorbital one or the intracanicular one. Very normal arrangement here with the ganglion cells starting to project down into the uh, nerve. And in glaucoma or things that are affecting the eye, you get the nerve squished and it doesn't work very well. All right? So these are your pearls for the optic nerve. And I really could boil it down to just three from my perspective. I'm, I'm seeing somebody that can't, they're saying, I can't see out of my right eye, I can't see out of my right eye. I want to know, well, did this just come on suddenly? I mean, I'm talking suddenly like within hours or a day. Or does it have any pain? Does that eyeball hurt? And then uh, is it just one eye? Now, you can have acute bilateral optic neuropathies. That can happen. But generally, that's not the case. It's just who's going to be one eye or the other. Now, also relevant, number four question is, can you make out any color with that right eye or that r left eye? And that is very relevant, and I'll get to that. And then in terms of your clinic clinical testing, we're going to talk about how pupils behave, and then we'll talk about what the eyeball looks like. And I sure hope, yeah, Linda Lehman's here. Okay, so Linda will, will, will correct me as I go along. I, and Linda, I already introduced this as neuro-ophthalmology for dumbing, so uh, you can help refine things as we go along. So <clears throat> Tim Huxer and I reviewed a lot of videos to try and show you live testing of rap, uh, relative afferent pupillary defect and I could not find one that I ever felt was very good because you always got a lot of reflection from the eye and you never could really see it. I couldn't see it. So I'm going to give you this kind of graphic presentation and I think it's very simple, very straightforward. So here are your pupils. They look fine. Now remember, you take out the optic nerve, the pupil isn't going to work, right? So here we shine that light into this uh, pupil and it's great, it reacts down beautifully, and furthermore, there's a consensual response on the other eye that didn't even get any light. It's perfect. That's all great. But then you come on and you shine it on the other eye, you swing the flashlight over there, and lo and behold, it doesn't shrink down, it stays big. And lo and behold, on the other side, it's big as well. Now the reality is, and Linda, you can correct me if you like, but the reality is when you do this, what you'll see with the pupil is a lot of 
in and out, in and out, in and out. And you're kind of sitting there, well, now did that really get big or is that really constricting down? So-called hippus of the iris is very difficult to sort out. So I always do this, but at the end of the day, if I'm not convinced, I'm not going to uh, put a lot of money on that. And uh, uh, it will be a subtext to everything I say here. Eventually, you're going to get the ophthalmologist involved. So back to the whole color thing. Color, as I said, number four on the list, if the person is just kind of grayed out in their vision and they're not totally black, uh, ask them about color because color is extremely sensitive for the optic nerve. So, you know, neurologists famously used to walk around with the little red pins in their lapel because you'd hold that pin up to their eye and because if they couldn't see, they read desaturated, you'd say, oh, it's the optic nerve. Well, um, two things. One is we don't do that anymore. Second is red really wasn't the right color. <laughs> it turned out to be more of a blue or a purple color that was more effective. If they couldn't see purple, that would point to the optic nerve. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, that was an example of Ishiara plates, which aren't readily available everywhere you go. Um, but uh, that's something that the ophthalmologist would use. You, can you read that number? Uh, e even though there's a color uh, discretion. So I think the bottom line on, on optic nerve, which I'm going to say about 14 times, is if you're old, you're not going to miss giant cell arteritis, right? If a person comes in, they're 60, and they suddenly lost vision in one eye, you're going to worry very much about giant cell arteritis, period. If they're young, you're going to worry more about optic neuritis and hence MS and things of that sort. Now these are all kind of dogma that people carry around. A third of them will have an abnormal disc and we're going to talk about fundoscopy in a minute. Um, and there may be features with uh, blood flow to the eye uh, that you can pick up on the disc. But from my perspective, if they're older, either they got giant cell arteritis or they have problems with circulation of the eyes. For instance, a 70-year-old diabetic and hypertensive, there's nothing to say that the optic nerve, I mean, optic ophthalmic artery goes bad and they, they have a stroke to the uh, nerve. Um, so these buzzwords you'll hear, anterior uh, ischemic optic neuropathy, chronic reversible anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, um, and then the other thing you hear about, sometimes they will tell you that it's just all horizontal. Bottom part is black, and then you, you're familiar with that as far as more being stroke. But other issues uh, include glaucoma, and all the other ones generally are going to be slow. You can have the hereditary Liebers come on suddenly, but generally all the other ones, compressive, if you've got a tumor or something in the eye that's making it go down, it'll be slow. You got tobacco, alcohol, amblyopia, it'll be slow. Infections generally are not sudden in nature. So here is our fundoscopy. And uh, do uh, none of us like to do fundoscopy. Isn't that true? You have these things sitting in your office and you, you don't really like doing it. And I understand why. Uh, the only one you really want to look at is the uh, like a 20 year old with a pupil that's eight millimeters and then you can kind of look in there and you can see something right a uh, 70 year old with a three millimeter pupil yeah i've been told you're supposed to put drops in and dilate it you don't want to do that i don't want to do that you're just screwing things up so i'm going to give you my down and dirty about fundoscopy which is if you do take a look in there what you want to try to see is can you see the margin of the disc all right now this case you can beautifully this case you can't and furthermore you can see that that blood vessel gets buried in there and there's something funny about that disc this isn't so great either this is kind of a blown out pale disc and very homogeneous this is a very normal looking disc with its little cup and this is a disc that's also having trouble so just some very simple things in terms of fundoscopy um, remember you know, the classic thing about optic neuropathy is, or optic neuritis is, the patient can't see anything and you can't see anything, right? So two-thirds of the time, the problem is not going to show up on the optic disc. So now here's glaucoma and my only nod to the glaucoma. Again, remember, you're having pressure down onto the optic nerve 
and that's why it causes difficulty and you usually get a kind of a constricted quality to the image as you're going along. Surely that can occur acutely, but most cases kind of creep along. Um, now, back to where I'm more happy is the optic nerve within the orbital area. And in this circumstance, you see it beautifully highlighted. And ordinarily, if it's neuritis, you'd expect the nerve to be bad. This is actually a case where there's a problem with the lining of the sheath of the optic nerve. And uh, that's a different kettle of fish. Um, so, again, kind of wrapping this up, optic neuritis and giant cell iodoritis are in capital letters for good reason. Um, then you have the other elements that I listed, which are not going to go into detail about that. And the one we deal with a lot is pseudotumor. Um, so, now this is an optic neuritis. This is what you would see. It's all kind of blurred out. It's the whole thing. It's not the top or the bottom. It's the whole thing is bad. And it's on one side. The other side is just perfectly fine. And then you do the MRI, and you've got a beautiful inflamed nerve. Um, and furthermore, the MRI of the brain has a few nicks. Um, that's where I get involved, because uh, if you just have the optic nerve and no abnormalities in the MRI, that individual has a 50% chance of going on to having MS at some point or another. Whereas if they have abnormalities in their brain, they're 75% sure to have MS. And this is always moving. You know, the biomarkers now with CSF and imaging, we're trying to get away from the whole diagnosis of MS as being two lesions separated in time and space and just going with the biomarkers. But regardless, optic neuritis in a young person, it's a huge issue for multiple sclerosis or pending multiple sclerosis. Okay, so bottom line, in terms of treatment, you can treat it with steroids. Uh, certainly with giant cell arteritis, it can be curative. With steroids and optic neuritis, you will reduce the duration of the deficit. And, that's, and there's evidence that you can also re reduce the onset of multiple sclerosis, which is even more peculiar. Okay. So again, I've already kind of given you this. If they're over 50, you're going to worry about giant cell arteritis. If they're under 50, optic neuritis. This is the big trial that was carried out well, not that long ago. And if you just have the features of a painful vision, that is, you move the eye and, gosh, it hurts. Um, I can't see purple. And it's one eye. And uh, most of the time, you're going to say it's optic neuritis. And most of the time, you're going to be correct. Two out of uh, basically 459 did not have optic neuritis. They had something else. They had a tumor or an aneurysm. So uh, you don't worry about optic neuritis if, it, if it's bilateral, if it's progressive, painless, and they have normal color vision. And of course, get ophthalmology involved. And these are various people that you can call upon, and they're very good. They'll show up on a Sunday morning. They'll do a, a, a direct ophthalmoscopy. Op, op, what I, you know what I mean, fundoscopic, right? Okay, so now to number three, down and out. And uh, I mean, I still remember calls from the emergency room saying, yeah, I got a guy in here, his eye is down and out. Down and out, that says it all. And you see this gentleman here on the left, where is his left eye? It's down and out. And furthermore, he's got ptosis, that lid is down. Um, your, this is a complete third nerve injury, and we'll go over why it's there. But generally, if it's an older individual, you're starting to think about uh, ischemic problems to that nerve. Yes, you can have strokes to the nerve, you can have strokes to your brain, uh, but in this case, the third nerve has suffered a stroke. The fear is always, well, they've got a headache and maybe they've got an aneurysm that's pressing on the nerve and acutely caused the problem. And this is where you get into the whole thing about pupil sparing third. Now the joke is, and I think Linda will confirm this, is these are generally hypertensive diabetic people with atherosclerosis. And what happens in diabetes? Well, the pupil doesn't work anymore. So uh, you can't rely on what the pupil is doing in a diabetic, frankly, I, unless you can check the other eye. And if the other eye clearly has good reactivity, then there's no reason to think the uh, affected eye would not have normal pupil function. 
But the idea being, if the uh, pupil is spared, then it's the core of the nerve that's been damaged, and that's not due to something pressing on the nerve, because the fibers that control the pupil are on the outside of the nerve. Okay, so here we go. And you just think about it a little bit. You have your lateral rectus and your medial rectus, and you have your inferior and superior. And in the third nerve, here's this yellow device going through here, you wipe out uh, all but two of the nerves. You don't take out the fourth cranial nerve, which runs the superior oblique, and you don't take out the lateral rectus, run by the sixth nerve. So the eye naturally, because the lateral rectus is working, is going to drift out. And because the superior oblique is working, the eye is going to go down. So you have a beautiful, uh, very simple anatomical explanation for why they're having problems. And now this is kind of a summary for all these cranial nerves, and this is an oldie but a goodie, but I think it still points out the thing that I, I want to share, which is all these nerves can be affected in a similar fashion, but the idea of an aneurysm causing a problem with the fourth nerve or the sixth nerve is very unlikely, very rare to happen, whereas with the third nerve it can happen. All of them suffer from strokes and vascular injury to the nerve, and all of them suffer from tumors pressing on it. Trauma is probably the most common cause for all of these nerves going bad. I think you need to think about vascular buddies, and it's going to be a bottom line to this whole presentation, is that the neighbors of other nerves in the area uh, will give you orientation and localization. So uh, you get into the cavernous sinus, which is taking a little coronal section right through here. You get into all the nerves. Um, you get into the trigeminal nerves. You get into the oculomotor nerves. You get into the fourth nerve, and on and on and on. It's usually a posterior communicating artery pressing on the third nerve that you, you worry about in the emergency room. So the take home on the third nerve, you do have to rule out aneurysm. That usually will revol revolve around doing some imaging. As if I haven't said it often enough, you are going to worry about giant cell arteritis and inflammation. And then ischemic is usually, in my experience, most common and there's not much to do about it other than to reassure them, hey, you've had an injury to the nerve. Nerves know how to heal up. Just try to make sure your sugars and your hypertension and everything is good and gradually it'll get better. And then if not, uh, the ophthalmologist will provide your prism to, to compensate. And yes, you have an algorithm printed in your, but I'm not going to beat you to death with that. And again, everything seems to revolve all around the pupil, but don't forget that in a diabetic, the pupils sometimes don't work. So don't get hung up on that. So you can have problems with the eyelid, too. And so we're going to talk a little bit about pupils and eyelids. And uh, I think you can diagnostically recognize this guy has ptosis, right? And um, there's many reasons for a ptosis, for a drooping eyelid. You can have problems with the sympathetic drive. The sympathetic nerve triggers a smooth muscle that keeps the eyelid up. The third nerve uh, affects the striated muscle, which is levator papillary superioris. And then you can also have myasthenia in the facial nerve, the orbicular oculi. The whole thing around your eye can give you trouble. Okay, so now look at these pictures and see if you feel comfortable about this. You feel good about this one over here? Right? A little bit of droopiness, maybe a little smaller pupil on this side than that. Um, Look at uh, this one over here. I think it's even more subtle. Uh, but there is a Horner's on this side. Um, and then when you think about that, you have to go through this long song and dance. Well, it starts in the brain, goes down the spinal cord, goes outside, it climbs up the superior cervical ganglion, and then jumps onto the artery, and then the fifth nerve. Well, you don't want to talk about all that. But there's a long route, a long pathway, which this can uh, be disrupted and then lead to this picture right here. Classic one we always get quizzed about in medical school or wherever. Oh yeah, you had a tumor at the apex of your lung pressed on the nerve, created this Horner syndrome. Um, now this is, this is uh, Dr. Kitchell is not here, but this is uh, one thing he will rage about periodically. But uh, let's say this young lady came into your office 
And uh, you say, whoa, there's something terrible here. And furthermore, you shown a light at her left eye, and she has a headache, of course. You've shown a light in her eye, and uh, it doesn't respond at all. And so we have a non-reactive dilated pupil. What does that mean to anybody? Well, this person's going to die, right? Well, no, they're not going to die. Um, this is uh, an 80s pupil, young woman with maybe after a viral illness, has impairment of her parasympathetic drive to one eye. She has diminished reflexes. She has diminished sweat. And it's uh, something that always happens 4 o'clock Friday afternoon. But uh, that's, that's life in the big city. And, uh, um, but it is very reassuring to say, yeah, this is just a funny parasympathetic problem. And it may go away. It may not go away. So we already talked about the sympathetic drive to the pupil. And, and this would, parasympathetic would also be the third nerve, the oculomotor nerve that's down and out. We already talked about that. And so you just need to know the neighbors. And this is a very complicated picture, but I was just trying to emphasize that you got influence from the oculomotor and sympathetic. Um, so it's kind of a summary. Okay, now this is pretty easy, cranial nerve four. Because, and it's funny, I've looked at photographs of my father for years and years, and uh, he always had his head tilted. <laughs> and I think he had a fourth nerve uh, as a child. And uh, so the, uh, seeing a person with a head tilt, uh, you always kind of keep that in the back of your mind. But then if you straighten it up, and you can see that their eyes are really askew and they don't like that, then you can think very strongly about uh, a fourth nerve injury. As I mentioned earlier, Fourth nerve is typically a traumatic thing. It's irreversible. It's done. Uh, but they can compensate for it with prisms or with tilting their head. Um, so anyway, just some images. And if you want to do the Bielchowski, you can really accentuate it by going away from their unaffected side to their affected side, and it will really bring the, devi the deviation out. However, I really thought this was very cool, and this is maybe one pearl you'll take away from your talk today. You can also have them look at the door. Just look at the top of the door and then have them talk about the two images. So if they look at the top of the door, and here's the top of the door right there, and they say, yep, yep, the other image is coming down like this, then that tells you that it's the right eye that has the trochlear nerve problem. The angle points to the affected side. And similarly, no, 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 it's uh, pointing to the left, the false image then uh, you have an answer that way, too. Kind of a slick little device. I've never had a chance to use it, but... Okay, coming down the home stretch on the last one, which is the sixth cranial nerve. Okay, so I'll tell you a story because this is getting a little bit boring. Um, so the, uh, the, the story is, uh, and this was early in the 90s when I first came here, um, emergency consult from a guy who had double vision. He was driving down Highway 35, and uh, all of a sudden, geez, I'm seeing two of everything. This is terrible. And uh, so he pulled off and came into the emergency room, and, you know, we rush over because he's obviously a 68-year-old going to have a stroke. Um, the fact is that uh, he was very astute, and he said, when I said, well, how, why didn't you pull off the road and just stay there? Well, if I just kept my eyes right in front of the car, I was okay. I didn't, I didn't have too much trouble. But the moment I tried to look further out, it was terrible. It's just terrible. And that is the big clue because you can compensate for a sixth nerve palsy or a lateral rectus injury if you uh, keep your eyes closed in. If you try to expand them all the way out and accentuate the use of the lateral rectus, the diplopia gets worse. Uh, so it's worse in distance. Um, and this story is finishes because there was nothing. We did this big, massive workup on this guy, and it turns out that he had a latent exophoria. That is, he was, as a kid, had a little bit of a lazy eye, and then as a young adult, he compensated, was able to keep the vision together, and then as a 68-year-old, when driving down Highway 35, all of a sudden, the image drifted off. He was tired. He was tired, and they couldn't keep the eye together anymore. So you always have to worry about disastrous things, but sometimes they're, they're pretty innocent. 
And so I always thought this was a great mnemonic, six causes of six nerve, you know, six of six, but it's probably not very useful. Um, you have muscle, neuromuscular, orbital, cavernous sinus, prepontine, and pontine is what we learned a long time ago. But just to put some image to it, so here's the lateral rectus, and that can go bad. Why can it go bad? Somebody's got acute thyroid disease, they have a thyroid ophthalmology, ophthalmopathy. Um, they can have a problem of myasthenia that just came up and the nerve muscle junction is just not working. They can have a problem in the superior orbital fissure. Uh, all these structures have neighborhood agents that can compromise the nerve. Um, but then likewise, you can reside all the way into the pons. So the generalities for double vision, horizontal, or skew is that you always worry about thyroid disease, giant cell arteritis, and myasthenia gravis. That should be done in the emergency room, in your office, just get it done. Is it always better with one eye closed? And I didn't emphasize this uh, with the optic nerve business, which is um, you don't get double vision with one eye, right? That just, that just doesn't happen, but it can happen if a person has like an ectopic lens in their eyes. So, and again, that's clearly where you need an ophthalmologist to sort that out. But generally, if they say they're having double vision with one eye, you, you're, you're probably out of your league and you don't need to worry about the nerve itself. Okay, so uh, is it always better with one eye closed? Is it vertical or horizontally displaced? Is it acute or chronic? And that's so important. And then these are the things you're gonna do there. And there they are. Um, so, and those were the ophthalmologists in the community, by the way, okay? So when you're considering cranial nerve problems, uh, where is the site of injury? That's what you're trying to sort out. And you're gonna sort that out by neighborhood sign. Um, and then there's a spectrum that we've covered for each of these. And then you always wanna think about the skull anatomy and bony canals as playing a part of this. Imaging will help you in all that. So I don't have any funny story at the end. That's kind of the end of the story. But uh, if you will stay tuned in January, you will be subjected to a brutal review of trigeminal, facial, glossopharyngeal nerve pathology. So that's it for this then. So, so any questions or anything on your mind? Or Linda, would you kind of opine, is there anything, your thoughts in terms of these kind of cranial nerve problems? Anything you see more commonly or you think we could do better in terms of? Well, I think you emphasize the main thing, which is don't miss giant cell arteritis, which can be missed. You know, it's not always classic. They don't always come in saying it hurts right here. And right. Um, so that's the main thing. Young people, optic neuritis, I totally agree. Uh, as far as monocular double vision, you can have that if you have a cornea problem or a lens problem. So sometimes even a cataract can cause a monocular diplopia. So we'd be happy to help with that. But yeah, if, I mean, that helps you to localize. I mean, you ask people when they have double vision, did you close one eye or then the other? That, that also helps with uh, migraine type things, you know, have, because people don't always do that. So you might suggest they cover one eye and then the other. Yeah. But I'd be happy to answer any questions too. Right. And again, I really appreciate their, uh, I know it's happened on a Sunday morning where we've been worried about a stroke issue and they've come in and uh, clarified things very quickly for us. Thanks, Sheldon. Um, how strong is the association of the anosmia with the neurodegenerative process? I mean, can you can you use the presence of smell to rule things out, or is it not that that tight? No, I think that uh, the presence of smell is a uh, is positive. You know, I think if they they have smell, I'm not too worried about it. Um, now, you know, we're in this mumbo jumbo of dementia where we talk about mild cognitive impairment, right? So somebody who clearly is having some memory problems and uh, yet is quite functional, uh, they may well have preserved smell. Whereas somebody who is demented, can't find their way from point A to B, they ain't gonna have smell. And that's fairly solid. Okay, well it's all yours, Steve. You can talk about the grand rounds now, right? Thank you. Just have a couple slides to uh, for you to opine on.
I need to advance in here. <laughs> oh, here we go. Okay, you just uh, punch the appropriate button. taped over all the buttons but one. Okay. That's it. So uh, see you in three weeks. Thanks. Thanks.